A portion of this episode is sponsored by KiwiCo. More on that later. Computed axial lithography, but infinitely at UC Berkeley. Hey, Joe. Hello. Computed axial lithography. That's that volumetric process of printing within a volume, but all at once. And now you're able to do it, but infinitely. infinitely. That's right. How is that possible? So this is an adaptation on Cal, where instead of printing into a container of uh, liquid material, we actually cast a gel onto an infinitely long continuous film, and we can print volumetrically into this gel continuously. Okay, okay. So the, the container isn't spinning, the material isn't spinning, the material exists on a film, then that film is moving as mm -hmm. you're projecting images into it, and then it prints within that material that's on the film. Yeah. It so, sounds a little complicated. You just blew my mind. Yeah. So instead of, <laughs> instead of a cylindrical uh, container, now we actually make the material wrap around a cylindrical roller. And then we get the rotation and we still project onto it as we normally would with a cylindrical container. And that's where the superposition of these projections allows us to do the volumetric printing. Being able to utilize these, these methods of creating something all at once is just fascinating because I'm used to being able to build up something layer by layer. Mm -hmm. And now you're telling me that not only can you do it volumetrically all at once, but multiple different ways. We've got the spinny container way, and now we have this belt, this mm -hmm. tape, this feed. What actually is this material here? Yeah, this is just a, a very common um, PET plastic material. So it's, I don't know, you make oh, water bottles. Oh, nothing special. It's just PET material. Yep. Oh, okay. You know, we print with that in our 3D printers. Yeah. Make things by layers, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then you said cast it upon this. So mm -hmm. that material that's within that initial container in order to cast it into a shape that can survive this belt feed here. How, how is that done? Yeah. So we take, we take a pretty uh, pretty typical 3D printing monomer, and we add a thermoplastic binder to it. So this, this is a component that allows us to make it into a gel. Um, it's about 7 to 10% of the total formulation is this binder material. Oh. This makes it thermoreversible, kind of like, like a household jello almost, where you oh. can... You heat it up and it melts away. heat it up, it melts away, or you you cool it or let it sit at room temperature for long enough and it will gel into a solid. That's right. Jello is better at cold because at room temperature, it's just a liquid. Yeah. So this is the jello of your world. Mm -hmm. And there's always room for jello. Okay. Yeah, and so then... it, can, it turns a normal, <laughs> a normal 3D printing resin into kind of a gel. Hey, look what just arrived. This is the electric pencil sharpener kit. This is from KiwiCo and it is a part of their Eureka Crate line. Let's put it together. KiwiCo provides a monthly crate delivered to your door that includes all sorts of really nifty projects that get you hands on. Look at that. Hey, that's going great. They're designed by experts and tested by kids. There's nine lines in total, and there's something for every interest in every age and even newborn kids. Cool. One thing to remember, KiwiCo crates make excellent gifts, but also it allows you to experience what KiwiCo offers before you subscribe. Look at that. It's done. To get started, go to kiwico.com forward slash 3D Printing Nerd and use code 3D Printing Nerd to get 50% off your first month of any monthly line, including the Eureka Crate. A huge thanks to KiwiCo for sponsoring this part of the episode. And before I send you back to the show, I just have to let you know, someone stole my pencil. I can't find it. So you're going to have to stick around to the end to see the pencil get sharpened. All right. Now back to the show. So that material then sticks onto this pretty well because it has to follow all of these, these turns and loops that, that this is creating. I'm, well, it's hard to imagine right now because we have it covered up and the reason for that is why. Right, so there's, there is a photo initiator in this, in this gel mixture. and Photo initiator it... being something that reacts to light, right? Right, right. Okay. So that makes it sensitive to the light and including this, the room light. So we need to keep it covered so that it doesn't start to uh, react. Is there a certain wavelength of, wavelength of light that the photo initiator is like tuned to? Yeah, this photo initiator has a peak, um, peak sensitivity around 470 nanometers, which is, which is about blue, blue light. Oh, blue so, light. 
I'm yeah. a big fan of blue, and apparently you are too. <laughs> yeah. We're twins. Then, okay, so when this is off, you could have just non-blue light, like a red light or, or mm -hmm. like a photography light. Is that the kind of thing that we would be doing? Yeah, so we can see like this, I use this red light down here for uh, imaging during printing. This helps me to visualize it, to see when, when I should stop illuminating or, or reduce power. And the red light doesn't actually affect the, affect the material because it's not sensitive to red light. I see. And now in doing this, I'm wondering, well, first, I want to see it run. Like, I'd love to see this move. But before we get to that part, I'm hoping that you can kind of give me a little bit of information about what sort of applications this has. Mm -hmm. Because right now, what, what I can see and what I have seen, it's, it's, it's a thin substrate and you're, you know, printing into it volumetrically. And so what, what sort of applications does being able to do this on an infinite scale, what is that? Like, mm -hmm. what does that give you? Yeah, I think the biggest application we see so far is in membranes and filtration for desalination, where the turbulence of the fluid going through it affects like contamination buildup. If you can influence the turbulence by changing the structure of the, the membrane, then you can actually reduce that contamination and make it more efficient. Another application is like biological models where you have parts that have length scales that vary a lot. So you might have microvasculature structures down on the micron scale, and then the scale of the whole organ might be centimeter scale. All right, can I see it running? I want to see it run. Of course. Okay, so I'm about to do a print. Here we go. That was cool, dude. That was cool. Well, once that process is done and there's parts available, can we, do you have any? Like, can I see some? Sure, I have a bunch of different types of structures. Um, Ooh, a box of science right here. Mostly uh, lattice type structures. Okay. So this is, this is what that one would look like if we developed it. Whoa. Very fine features, about 100 and, 150 micron thickness. Jeez. Um, and the, the pore size is around, around a millimeter. Yeah. It still boggles my mind that this was something continuously made. Like not just, and it wasn't just an additive process, it was an all at once additive process, but continuously. Mm -hmm. And that getting that, that small detail, that resolution, but at an infinite scale, I think has some incredible implications for the future. Well, obviously everybody out there is gonna be excited to know more about this. Is there anywhere they can go to find out? Yeah, we have, we have an archive paper that's uh, publicly re released, just this version. And in the future, coming soon, we'll have uh, a journal paper. I'll put a link down to everything down below, obviously, once I have the stuff. If you made this far, you're awesome. Don't forget to hug each other more. Fight for a cause you believe in and continuously, volumetrically print all the things. And as always, high five. No one? <laughs> Crisp.